This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, episode 19, How to Read William Shakespeare's Richard II. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is Shakespeare's history play, recounting the story of an abdication in 1399, the transfer of power from Richard II to Henry IV. This play is not Shakespeare's best-known play, but in some ways it can claim to be his best-written play. It's the only one that is written entirely in verse, and it's the beginning of a very long series of eight plays that deal with its consequences. In this episode, I will begin first with an overview of its plot and major events and talk about where the story of Richard II fits into Shakespeare's other history plays. And then I'll raise that question I just mentioned implicitly of genre. Is this a history play? And just what is a history play? Or is it in fact a tragedy? And then, in addition to going through the implications of that question, I will conduct close readings of two of its major speeches, John of Gaunt's This Sceptered Isle speech in Act 2, Scene 1, and Richard's long speech about the ways that ceremony upholds kingship in Act 3, Scene 2. conflict at the core of Richard II is a conflict between power and authority, between the ability to do a thing and the legitimacy of actually doing it. King Richard has authority, but no power. Whereas Henry Bolingbroke, who takes Richard's crown, assumes power, but on no legitimate authority. And the consequences of this action resonate through the generations of Bolingbroke's successors. The play begins with a duel between Bolingbroke, the Duke of Hereford, and Thomas Mowbray, the Duke of Norfolk, over who has killed the Duke of Gloucester. Each of them is accusing the other of the crime. The king then intervenes in order to stop this duel in a misguided effort to stop civil conflicts, which actually ends up just provoking a far worse one. Later on, by the way, we are going to learn what Richard's real motive is, that he himself is implicated in Gloucester's death. When the two dukes actually, in defiance of Richard, take up the quarrel again, Richard responds by banishing them from the kingdom. He banishes Bolingbroke for ten years, he later reduces it to five, and he banishes Mowbray for life. Again, Richard is trying to prevent an internal enemy from fomenting civil unrest and fomenting resistance to his rule. And he's right to be suspicious of Bolingbroke because Richard's subjects actually favor Bolingbroke over Richard himself. In a very stirring speech, John of Gaunt, who is Bolingbroke's father, prophesies the decline of England. And this is a speech full of themes of self-conquest, of Richard's invitation of usurpation onto his own head. Let's pause now to look at John of Gaunt's speech in Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 40 following. It begins with an extended series of what are called anaphora, A-N-A-P-H-O-R-A. That is the beginning of a series of clauses that all start with the same word, the word this, which has the effect of almost a bulleted list of cumulative descriptors for England. England, according to Gaunt, stands apart from other nations. It is chosen by God, it has internal unity, and it performs overseas service, particularly for preserving Christianity through its crusader knights in the Holy Land. And yet, it is also undermined by self-conquest. And that is going to be a theme that Oddly enough, his own son, Bolingbroke, is going to promulgate by actually rebelling against the legitimate King Richard. Starting at line 40, this is Gaunt's speech in full. This royal throne of kings, 
This sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds, as far from home for Christian service and true chivalry as is the sepul sepulchre in stubborn Jewry of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world, is now leased out. I die pronouncing it li like to the tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with the triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. In the ensuing scenes, that is more or less exactly what we see. Richard alienates his friends. He punishes his subjects with taxes to pay for a military campaign in Ireland against another internal rebellion, by the way. And Richard then falls because of these and other mistakes. He surrounds himself with flatterers. He taxes his people excessively and he confiscates the property of landed aristocrats, like Gaunt himself. Richard is, however, unrepentant, and as soon as Gaunt dies, he opportunistically seizes the estate. And that is the decisive move that precipitates Richard's downfall. As the Duke of York reminds him, punishing his friends will only turn them against him, losing what he says, a thousand well-disposed hearts, which is exactly, exactly what happens. Bolingbroke then returns from exile with an army to recover his inheritance, uh, both of his lands, uh, that is his property, and of his title, the Duke of Lancaster. Meanwhile, Richard returns from Ireland and he asks the ground itself to defy these enemies. In Act 3, Scene 2, Line 24, he says, These stones prove armed soldiers ere her native king shall falter under foul rebellion's arms. And yet, despite that appeal, uh, Richard's troops are actually defecting to Bolingbroke. Bolingbroke ultimately agrees that he will surrender, but only if he's reinstated to his inheritance. He never, this is notable, he never actually explicitly asks for Richard's crown. And yet, Bolingbroke's power grows. He arrests noblemen, for instance, for murdering Gloucester. And meanwhile, Queen Isabella overhears gardeners who are discussing the overthrow of her husband. This is, by the way, an utterly invented scene, but there are many precedents for viewing the kingdom as a garden, with its people uh, metaphorically divided into the flowers and the weeds. Richard ultimately agrees to abdicate his throne, his crown, to Bolingbroke. And the Bishop of Carlisle objects very stridently, saying, on the grounds of what's called the divine right of kings, which I'll talk about in a moment. He tells Richard that, quote, the power that made you king, that is God himself, quote, hath power to keep you king in spite of all. Meanwhile, a plot against Bolingbroke gets discovered and he decides that he's going to forgive the conspirators, Bushy and Bagot and Green. And ultimately, a man named Pierce Exton visits Richard in prison and murders him, believing wrongly that Bolingbroke wanted that to happen. Bolingbroke, who has since been crowned Henry IV, denies that he wanted that, and he vows a pilgrimage to the Holy Land 
in order to atone for the crime. As I mentioned earlier, it's unclear whether this is a history or a tragedy. So now let's look at the arguments for and against both of those positions. There are a few arguments, let's begin with tragedy, that suggest that it is tragic. The title of one of its early quartos, 1597, was The Tragedy of King Richard II. So it's at least there in the title. The question is, was it actually a tragedy? Well, firstly, when the king dies, the play is effectively over. That's tragic. There's also an extended simile in Act 14, 1 following line 150, sorry, 174, in which Richard describes two buckets that are filling one another, one being raised, the other being lowered. And this is sometimes called a de casibus tragedy. That's a Latin term, D-E-C-A-S-I-B-U-S tragedy that refers to the uh, a genre that contains or recounts the downfalls of noble or high-born individuals, uh, sometimes paraphrased as the falls of princes. And so the buckets are like the wheel of fortune. If one is going to rise, the other needs to fall. You can really sense Richard's uh, self-pity, self-belief that he is living through a tragedy. If we look now to Richard's extended speech about the ceremony that upholds a king in Act 3, Scene 2, lines 150 following. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared, and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit, as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humoured thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin bores through his castle wall, and farewell king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? Ceremonious duty in line 169 here is the division, the line that divides a mortal man who tastes bread and and lives uh, in a mortal body and yet is regarded and said and mistaken to be more than that, to be believed a king rather than a subject. All of these things, in other words, are external to himself. Without ceremony, what is kingship? It is merely external recognition. And so in Henry V, a play that will follow this many years later in the historical sequence, the king walks anonymously among his subjects on the eve of battle. He repeats something like this line, saying that, quote, idle ceremony is the only thing that distinguishes kings from subjects. By the way, Henry V is the son of Henry IV, and he himself, Henry V, is mentioned in passing in Richard II when Henry IV wonders aloud where his dissolute son has been. The first and second parts of Henry IV, the two history plays that follow this 
Richard II in sequence, will actually expand on that story considerably and bring Henry from a wayward youth to a settled sovereign. And yet, it's not, in back to this speech, it is not flattery that Richard abhors, it is, which is merely a debased, insincere, beguiling version of ceremony. He wants the truth of respect and regard. So, do all of those features and this speech alone make it a tragedy? Of course not. This play may actually have a stronger claim to being a history play, but that's up for debate. Let's consider that side of the equation. This play is the first in what's called a tetralogy, which is a word that means a four-text sequence, in this case, four plays. Richard II, the first part of Henry IV, the second part of Henry IV, and Henry V. Shakespeare actually writes two tetralogies, that is, eight uh, plays more or less in sequence. The other tetralogy covers the civil wars of the 15th century called the Wars of the Roses. And that other tetralogy consists of the first part of Henry VI, the second part, and the third part of Henry VI, and then Richard III. Now that tetralogy, which is not this one, that tetralogy actually follows sequentially in history, but confusingly enough, it is called the first tetralogy only because Shakespeare wrote it first. It was written earlier. Now, sometimes these eight plays, that is, Richard II, 1 and 2, Henry IV, Henry V, 1, 2, 3, Henry VI, and Richard III, sometimes these eight plays are actually called the Henriad, which is an old-fashioned term. Frankly, that term doesn't really apply because it tries to totalize and combine them into a single epic sequence, which these are absolutely not. These are plays written with different forms, written at different times, never with some kind of false narrative of a grand design in Henry in, in Shakespeare's head, rather. Their only epic quality is their breadth. They cover a vast array of monarchical, aristocratic, uh, civil war history from 1377 all the way through to 1485. Like epics, they do focus on aristocratic history and quarrels, like I said. They are nationalistic, but again, to say that they are the Henriad, it's if Shakespeare intended this from the beginning, is simply not correct. For an old-fashioned critic named E.M.W. Tilliard, however, there was a very conservative view of those eight plays. Tilliard used to say that Richard II's death in this play was akin to an original sin. And in the next seven plays, we see the consequences of that sin. And it's not until the death all the way in 1485 of Richard III do we see the rise of the Tudor dynasty in order to resolve it? That is, by the way, Henry VII, who was the grandfather of the current monarch, I'm sorry, current when Shakespeare was writing Elizabeth I. So, the Bishop of Carlisle actually voices what something similar to what Tilliard is saying in Act 4, Scene 1. He says that the king is above question. He says the king has divine right, and if he's deposed, quote, the blood of English shall manure the ground. He predicts a civil war, in other words, and that's absolutely what is going to happen in plays that Shakespeare has already written, but none of these consequences actually happen within this play itself. You can contrast that, by the way, with Julius Caesar. Uh, that's a play also about regicide, but it's a regicide that happens in the middle of the play, and the latter half is about the consequences, the overthrow of the conspirators. Quite analogously, Shakespeare's other play, Macbeth, has a regicide near the beginning. It has the rise and fall of those who perpetrate reg regicide. It has the full arc, the action and the consequences, but we don't see the consequences of Richard II's death within this play. This play was written in 1595. 
printed in its first quarto edition in 1597, and there were two more quartos in 1598, so evidently it was a pretty strong commercial success. In the first folio text of 1623, there's the invented genre of a history play, which is separated from the more recognized genres of tragedy and comedy. So what is it that a history play actually means? Well, it means a play in which the events are largely about medieval English history. Its story is factual rather than mythical, which is why something like King Lear or Cymbeline, for example, are not lumped or connected or categorized under the the heading of history plays, even though they have historical, well, pseudo-historical contents. In the 1623 folio, the title of this play is actually The Life and Death of Richard II. That is, not the tragedy of Richard II. It, uh, in other words, his, the historical sequence doesn't have any room for tragedy. And yet, as Emma Smith has pointed out, history continues on, whereas tragedies tend to be apocalyptic. At the end of a tragedy, we tend not to care very much about the future, about what comes after. If you think about Fortinbras at the end of Hamlet, Bolingbroke is not like Fortinbras because he's more consequential. History continues through succession. And succession depends on a hereditary throne, that is, one that is passed down through primogeniture, which is a word that means the right of the firstborn and their descendants. If you interfere with primogeniture, you interfere with divine prerogatives, the so-called divine right of kings. The historian Ernst Kantorovich has a formulation that he calls the king's two bodies. And Richard has referred to this in his extended speech in 3.2, Act 3, Scene 2. The two bodies are the body natural, the one that dies, the one that ages, the individual king or queen's physical body. And on the other hand, the body politic, the one that extends beyond any one particular king's mortal body and transfers on to the next office holder, that is, the institution of the crown. When you say, the king is dead, long live the king, you invoke the two bodies theory. So, monarchy is opposed to tragedy because it's opposed to the end-stopped idea of tragedy. This play asks whether a monarch loses their right to divine authority if they cease to rule justly. And that was a very, very pertinent question in the century after Shakespeare wrote Richard II. In 1649, King Charles I was tried and executed for treason. Abdication tends to disrupt divine authority, which is why it's so dangerous. Most recently, in the 1930s, the Edward VIII abdication crisis was a grand illustration of this. And so Richard II also provokes the question of whether a monarch can willingly bequeath their crown to anyone besides the rightful heir who's chosen by primogeniture. let's turn to the historical context behind this play. No history play of any kind depicts the long settled reign of an established monarch. And that is because disruption is the norm and it makes for a far more interesting dramatic play. Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, who was on the throne between 1558 and 1603, was, by the time Shakespeare was writing this, very old and without an heir. She, however, forbade discussions of the succession, about who would succeed her. But a drama about a king from 300 years, sorry, 200 years before, could treat a subject like that much more openly. However, proclaiming the the glory of the Tudors, that is Elizabeth and her family, as precluding civil war, 
when the dynasty itself was embodied by an aging queen who had no children, was not exactly reassuring. These anxieties in the 1590s about the Elizabethan succession are Shakespeare's prime context for Richard II. This is a moment of transfer. This is a moment of rival claims to the throne and so on. And like Richard II, Elizabeth, as I say, lacked an heir. She was also like Richard II, surrounded by counselors that some people considered bad. She is supposed to have acknowledged the resemblance between herself and Richard by saying, quote, I am Richard II, know ye not that, quite directly. But because of the uncomfortable echoes, the deposition scene in Richard II, in which he surrenders the crown, was actually excluded from quarto editions until 1608, until five years, that is, after Elizabeth died. In 1601, two years before her death in 1603, Richard the second was performed on a very particular occasion. Robert Devereux, the second Earl of Essex, had fallen out of Elizabeth's favor. He desperately tried to see Elizabeth, and he then led a desperate rebellion, which he claimed was against Elizabeth's bad advisors, bad counselors, but he was executed for treason. The Lord Chamberlain's men, that is Shakespeare's playing company, was then commissioned to perform the play, Richard II, or sorry, had been commissioned to perform the play in order to gather support on the eve of Essex's ill-fated rebellion. The playing company then was called to defend its actions, and they only escaped punishment by claiming ignorance, namely that they had been co-opted for contemporary political ends. mentioned earlier the simile of the bucket that lowers and the other one raises. There's another simile for the transfer of power that the Duke of York uses when he describes Bolingbroke's entrance into London. He describes the greedy eyes for him of the citizens in Act 5, Scene 2, whereas for Richard, the people find him tedious, like an actor who has outworn his welcome. Look at Act 5, Scene 2, Line 23, following. York says, As in a theatre, the eyes of men, after a well-graced actor leaves the stage, are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, or with much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. This is a recurring image in history plays, the king as an actor. But in York's speech, the difference between the two kings isn't one between true and counterfeit, between majesty and ignominy. It's actually just between a good actor and a tedious one. Both Bolingbroke and Richard are pretending to be kings, and neither are legitimate. Bolingbroke is just better at the role. And this image of a restless audience who shifts its attention and its affection from one actor to another is quite subversive when you're talking about monarchy. It's not, therefore, what or who is being authentic as the king, but who has more facility, who is better at performing the role. As I said at the outset, who has the authority to legitimate their power? And that is a contest that Richard is destined to lose. And that brings me to the conclusion of this episode of Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. This episode is quite indebted to Emma Smith's podcast, Approaching Shakespeare, recorded in 2017 at the University of Oxford, whose entire series is highly worthwhile. The next episode in this series is about the poetry of Andrew Marvell, including his famous Carpe Diem, or Seize the Day, poem, To His Coy Mistress.
In the meantime, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname, U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka.